It's great to be back here. I've missed drawing with everybody. It feels like it's been forever. It's been a couple of weeks and it feels like it's, it's been a lot longer than that. So welcome everybody. So many familiar names uh, and, and so many familiar uh, artists here to join me. So my name is Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artists Network. We meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. Uh, this is what we're drawing today, this poppy. Um, I thought it'd just be fun to kind of revisit a flower. It's been a while since we've drawn one of those and we've got a lot of kind of cool textures here. Um, so I pinned at the top of the chat a link to the art party that's tomorrow. We've already had about 500 people sign up for this, so I'm very excited for that. So it'll be me, Brent Eveston, and Gigi Chen as, as guests, and we're gonna kind of exchange ideas about drawing, share our approaches, answer your questions, and it should be it should be a lot of fun. So go to Artist Network and check that out. Um, if you're new, you wanna know that this show is all about drawing and drawing together specifically. So this reference image that's right below me here is in the chat below. Um, so you can bring that up, you can draw along, you can share your work on Artist Network. Um, there's a specific show page for this episode where you can share your work when you're done. Encourage one another, give feedback, simply just to kind of enjoy the process. And it's been awesome seeing everybody's development over the over a year that we've been doing this. So this is episode 102. Um, so I apologize for last week. That was my mistake. I uploaded a recorded video because I had another conflict. I wasn't able to do the live event. So I uploaded the recording, but I didn't get the time right. So it, it posted a little early. So I apologize for all the confusion. It should have happened at one, like the, or one my time in Colorado, 3 p.m. Eastern. So um, that was my bad. Uh, so, okay, what are we working on today? Okay, the materials giveaway. So Jerry's, awesome company that they are, um, partnered with us because we're celebrating drawing this week with the art party, with the show, everything. Um, and they, they provided a bunch of some really cool drawing materials and you can enter to win them as, as part of this giveaway on artistnetwork.com. So again, following that, that link that I just pinned to the chat, you can register to win that. And I'm actually gonna be using some of the materials here today because some of them are some, some cool extra toys that I hadn't really ever played with before, um, such as like this sharpener here. This has got a sanded surface so you can sharpen your pencils and it collects all the dust in the bottom. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, I sharpened these pencils using that. And you can see I have these, the charcoal pencils for today's project. I'm able to reuse the stubs. I've got this whole collection of about a hundred little stubs of charcoal pencils that I haven't been able to use because I didn't have one of these things. So that's in the kit too, one of these ex pencil extenders. So I'm gonna be working with that today um, as well as this you know, little stub of a charcoal white pencil. Um, this is the Legion toned paper. That's in the description below. It's not a very um, dark toned paper. It's just got a light kind of quality to it, but enough that it creates some contrast for those whites to be added later to really pop off. Um, other cool things, I've got my blending stump that I've been using a lot throughout the series. Um, two cool new erasers. So I've got this, uh, this electric one that, that's in the kit as well, uh, this accurate electric eraser for some of those uh, fine details as well as this Vanish rubber eraser. This thing works really well. <laughs> I was really excited to try it. So that's in the kit. Um, and oh, this Willow charcoal, uh, again, Jerry's Creative Mark. So I'll be using one of these. Let me use, let me use this one right here to lay out some of the, uh, some of the stuff, uh, some of the early stages. And I've got my, my kneaded eraser that I've been using. This is my second kneaded eraser for the entire show. So in 102 episodes, so over 200 drawings, because I do a preparatory drawing. And that's, that's, that's the kind of the magical quality of kneaded erasers. They seem to last forever. Um, let's see. All right, I think that's it. Um, so again, if you want to bring up the reference image and follow along, we'll get started. Um, in the giveaway, Jerry's had sent out this uh, a, a bunch of these these Soho sketchbooks. So we've got a, a craft paper, a toned tan tone paper, um, just standard white paper, and then this gray tone paper. And I, since I'm working on gray toned, I thought I'd take um, take an opportunity to use the sketchbook to kind of lay out some composition. You know, this is a relatively simple drawing. You know, it's really just that single subject. But part of the challenge when you, when you reduce the number of objects in a drawing is that the, there's just greater emphasis placed on whatever is remaining. So that one object 
it, it needs to carry the weight of the subject or the drawing more than if you were to have more stuff in it, right? And so the way we place that and we pay attention to the relationship between the positive space, the shape of the flower, and the negative space, the shape around it, that balance can affect the composition and how we interpret the subject and how, how strong that drawing is. Um, and, and also how we treat that background. So in this sketchbook, I was just using some black and white because you'll actually get some white uh, charcoal in, the, um, in that kit uh, as well. And so that's what I was kind of testing out here. Um, I just wanted to kind of play around with some basic value structures in this. So thinking about it in an abstract way, what is going to hold up. Now, I don't think either of these are particularly successful, but it just allowed me an opportunity to start to think through those things before I, I tackled the final uh, drawing. So um, now with this one, I kind of, I kind of got sucked into the details a little too early. And I talk about that a lot in the show. Um, and I, I do feel like there's perhaps a little bit too much space. I kind of have a bias to providing a little bit more space around the subject to, to really kind of pull in the viewer. Um, but I feel like I might've done a little bit. So I'll see, I'll see where this goes today. So um, yeah, let's just get to it. That was a longer intro than normal. So I apologize for that. So um, again, if you are following along, I love to hear all your questions, your comments, your own observations, what's happening for you on your drawing. Um, are you using the same materials, different? This is for us to draw together, not simply just to do things the way I do. Oh, um, so I have the reference image up here on my left where your chat is. So when I'm looking over here and I'm quiet, I'm looking at the chat. So um, I have the image in front of me. I, I'm seeing what you are seeing. So I'm seeing the kind of the overhead projection and that's what I'm going to be using to draw from the most. And I'm actually going to, I didn't really anticipate this, but I guess you can see that I'm kind of starting with this kind of gestural line to map out the overall composition. But I wanna quickly move away from that and start to think about mass, start to think about basic value relationships. So I wanna be thinking about general abstract qualities at this. So try not to think about it as being a flower at this point and think about it as just being shapes, just being values. And then we're gonna gradually refine. And so I think one of the kind of the discoveries in this whole series for me is finding a way to articulate the difference between refinement and details, right? Um, and that's something that we bring up a lot. And I, I trend, tend to emphasize the refinement of forms and selectively um, kind of deciding which elements are refined rather than thinking about details as something that is, that's added on top of the drawing. Um, and we're all gonna have our own kind of association with that or kind of set point for what makes sense in your drawing. This, is, this tape is kind of lifting up here. Hold on a second. I need a slightly stronger tape here because my hand's catching against that bottom edge and it's distracting. So that, paper, that tape is a little bit too, um, too soft, too light. I just need to, uh, the tape is really just to hold it down. When I do my preparatory drawings, I don't use, I don't, I don't tape it down. Um, so there, yeah, that's better. Now it's not catching on my arm. Um, oh, I'm sorry that, yeah, for some of you that are watching internationally, I'm sorry that you can't find some of these materials, but check out Jerry's. I don't know if they deliver overseas. Um, Sue saying you get all your materials from Jerry's, nearly all of them. Um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy working with Jerry's. And like I said, it was, it's, I felt very honored when they, um, when they agreed to kind of partner with our kind of celebration of drawing. So yeah, uh, tomorrow at, so it'll be five Eastern is when we're doing it. I, I'm in Colorado, so I have mountain time in my head. Uh, so I believe it's five uh, Eastern we'll be meeting um, and in the, on the description on the page, I have the list of materials I'll be using. So I'll be working with, with charcoal tomorrow, but Brent and Gigi, I'm not sure what they're going to be working with. So it'll be fun. And I actually chose three references, all birds. Um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of excited to see which reference they choose. But the idea is that, um, anybody who's watching can follow along f using the reference of their choice. So. 
All right, so with this quick gesture, um, if you're new, what I'm doing here is I'm simply getting information on the page. I don't know the particular qualities of this. I haven't sat with this subject enough to really understand it deeply. So my understanding of it is very surface level, and as a result, my drawing is very surface, right? So my, the, the evolution of the drawing is going to parallel the evolution of my, my thoughts, my understandings of the subject. So we're using the drawing process as a way to better understand the shape, the form, you know, the, uh, the, the really the texture, the particular qualities of this flower. Um, and in this early stage, I'm just kind of I'm, I'm mentally, I'm just kind of washing over the subject, thinking about um, what is it that I'm looking at? What are these basic forms? Kind of getting my, my head in the game more than anything. And then as information is built on the page, I'm gonna have more to go with and I can, I can make very specific decisions about what, um, what needs to happen with all of these forms. I can correct as we go. So in my, my drawing process at least, it's about starting with a gesture and then constantly refining that gesture. And then and with that, with the idea that we're building up the whole drawing at once, it puts you in control over where and how much detail you put into the drawing. Um, so just using the, the kind of the palm of my hand to kind of wipe this down, not my, not my greasy oily fingers. Um, so I normally have a paper towel and I don't, <laughs> I forgot. That's the one thing I forgot. So I'll have to use my hand. Um, Mad moments go, just finish the cake. Awesome. Um, and if you're new, I want to welcome you. This is a, this is a fun community. Um, I've been able to, to meet some of you virtually. Um, thank you for inviting to me to that, everybody on the Zoom call a couple weeks ago. Um, and you know, some of you through email, and it's been really cool. Everybody's very supportive and helpful. Um, and so this is a safe place to throw out observations and suggestions for me. Um, I welcome them. There is an art to providing uh, feedback, and I think you all have done a very good, you're all very adept at that, that art. When, it's, when, it's, when feedback is tactfully presented, it can be very helpful. When it's, when it's not, it, then it's just mean. <laughs> but nobody here is mean, so. Um, but we talk about that here. If you're, if you're kind of in your studio alone drawing, um, it can, it's so valuable finding somebody who can give you the right feedback, you know, and sometimes we, we reach out to whoever's available that, but you know, that person may not have any experience with providing feedback or articulating their own thoughts about artwork. Um, and that can sometimes not be very helpful at all. Kind of puts them on the spot to come up with um, something to say, and um, be like me going to a restaurant and being asked to write a review about the food, and I'm like, well, I guess I, I I like what I like, but <laughs> it wouldn't be a very good review um, because I haven't taken any time to really formulate thoughts and understandings of things that are helpful to other people. Um, all right, so. The, the kind of the ghostly form of the flower is starting to form. And, that, and that from the gesture, then a bulk of the drawing process is about correcting proportions. And so again, those of you who have been with us for a while are familiar with these tools, but the two primary tools that I use are angle sighting and comparative measuring. So the first thing I like to do is, is generally angle sight. So what I'm looking at are these broad angles, breaking down the form into a sequence of kind of short, straight angles. And you can compare the angles in your drawing to that of the reference. And if you hold your, if you close one eye and you hold your, say your pencil out as a guide, aligning this with the, the, the target in your reference, and then lock your wrist to, to lock that angle, carry it on top of your drawing, you can compare where your drawing is at with where it needs to be with regards to the reference. So if I'm looking at this angle here, for example, this can come up a little bit straighter, I think. Um, and, and it's really important to check your work vertically. So right now, of course, I'm working on this at a, 
at, a, at an angle. And so my understanding of the proportions is being impacted uh, by this, this difference in perspective. You know, so my brain is trying to correct the perspective distortion of me looking at it at this angle. So I have that projection in front of me that's vertical and that's gonna be more accurate. So I'm just, I'm taking the thumbnail on the screen, finding the angle and transferring it over to the thumbnail, the overhead projection on, uh, on the screen in front of me as well. This line here is just to find that angle to connect these two kind of high points in the shape of the flower. There's this negative space that we can kind of crop out, but there's an angle formed between those two and that can be helpful. And I'm, I have to, I have kind of to switch to my left hand because when I go like this, my, my hand cuts in front of the, in the screen and I can't see, <laughs> I can't see the drawing. So it's a little bit awkward. Uh, so I think that really the best setup um, if you're going for a sense of accuracy is, oh, I just got some paper towels delivered to me. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so, yeah, the best setup is to have your reference image and your drawing right next to one another. Or your, actually, the live, the live reference would be the best. If you can work from life, you're going to learn far more from that than any other situation. Um, then short of that, if like in this situation, we have a colored photograph, um, then a black and white photograph from there. And it all depends on what your motivations are. I'm choosing to use a colored um, reference photo here because it provides that challenge and the opportunity to, to learn how to translate the values of these bright colors um, you know, onto, into charcoal. So I'm looking at these, the red, looking at the yellow, that blue, and trying to interpret the value. And it gets tricky because color has three primary qualities. It's got hue, value, and saturation. The hue is the color, it's red, it's yellow, it's blue. The value is how light or dark it is, and the saturation is how intense it is, You're going from gray to its pure intensity. Um, and when a color is highly saturated, um, I know for me, the thing that I struggle with is that I interpret that high intensity, that high saturation as a lighter value than it actually is. And so if you were to take this photo and you were to convert it into grayscale, um, it, might, it might change your understanding of the, um, of the values a bit. Um, but I want that challenge. That's kind of what this drawing starts to be about is how do I translate that? And, and go through the struggle of solving the, the puzzle of the values of these colors. Um, but that may not be what works for you. You may prefer to convert this to grayscale and then draw from it. Um, so again, just kind of, it, it all depends on what your objectives are. And, uh, and part of what I like to emphasize in the show is is how we as artists, we, we give ourselves challenges to grow. And sometimes when we work by ourselves, we're forced to kind of come up with our own, um, our own challenges, kind of our own visual workout as it were. All right, so I'm kind of going through, I, you can see I'm still using comparative, I mean, sorry, the angle sighting, and I need to kind of step back a little bit and do some comparative measuring. So now that, the, the main form is being established, I want to compare the, first the, the basic dimension of the height versus the width. Um, so what I'm going to do is close one eye, again that flattens my depth perception, and when I hold it over the reference photo, I can align the top end of the charcoal with the top of the flower on the reference, slide my thumb down so that it aligns to that bottom point right here. So again, placing it directly on top of the reference. There we go. And if you hold your arm out fully extended, it, it keeps that scale relationship consistent between this measurement on your, on your uh, charcoal stick or whatever you're using. It keeps that consistent um, as, you, as you compare. If you move your arm in and out, that 
proportionally this this distance that you're measuring is going to change relative to the reference so keep that consistent by holding your arm outstretched and what I'm observe, observing is generally this the height versus the width is about one for the height to one and about a quarter for the width. So right now it's a little bit wide um, relative to its height. So I have, I have two options available to me. I can keep the height consistent. I can say that this is gonna stay locked and I can adjust the, the width of it or I can keep this locked and adjust the height um, I kind of like, I, I don't, I don't want to really extend above or below um, just because based on the way it's being framed in the camera right now, it's going to get a little bit too tight in there if I, if I move this down any farther or this up any farther. So I think I need to come in a little bit. Um, and I think at this point, what seems to be the case is, I think I, I had brought this outer edge out too much. And so my primary dimensions are starting to become formed. And now I can, from here, break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. So you're gradually refining and working from large decisions to smaller and smaller decisions. But those decisions that we make at each of those scale levels is generally the same. Um, and that's where my approach to drawing is really about thinking about the decisions we make and applying it to the subject. Um, and, and ideally, those decisions are gonna be consistent across all of the subjects. So um, the, uh, you know, if, we, if, I, if I try to think that drawing a flower is harder than drawing a person or drawing a landscape, and then it kind of trips me up a bit. And so I try to think, all right, if I just rely on the tools that I do know and apply it to every subject, then hopefully it will, it will get me through the, the drawing. You know, having said that, everybody here knows that portraits are really hard for me. <laughs> but again, I try to fall back on what I do know. I can use these tools for any subject. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. I see some new names. Uh, welcome, everybody. We've got people from um, Sverige. I don't know. For, hello. Um, let's see. Hello. Okay. I'm having a hard time reading. I need to make this a little bit larger on my screen. So uh, from Vienna, I've got people. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, if, you, um, if you like what you're seeing here, we've got all the episodes available on Artist Network, as well as, our, as a playlist here on YouTube. Uh, and they're not really presented in any specific order, so you can kind of jump in wherever you want. Um, all right. So in the process of refining, now you can see the tone of the, the drawing is, is darkening because I'm building up these layers of, of vine charcoal. And I'm going to stick with the vine charcoal. I like, um, I like this quality here. But as, um, as I feel more confident about the, the overall proportions, I'll switch to the compressed charcoal to make things that are a little bit more permanent. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm just kind of clearing my head a little bit by focusing on the background, building up some tone here just lightly using the side of the vine charcoal to build up layers of cross hatching. So laying down in a sequence of marks, marks in a particular direction, and then slightly changing the direction of your marks. And I, I'm doing this not only to build up some tone here, but to also kind of clear my head um, when we when we focus, when we, when we use the part of our brain that calculates the proportions, for me, it gets taxing, right? <laughs> I get exhausted. So I need areas in the drawing where I can just kind of let out some steam, right? And, and clear my head a little bit. Oh. And, and definitely when kind of talking through the process, um, can be more mentally fatiguing. In general, I find it all energizing, but it can also be a little bit tiring. All right, so 
wiping it down to kind of unify it. I still have kind of the ghostly image of the flower. So I'm making another pass at it. And um, at this pass, I can start to think about um, positive space and negative space. Positive space being the shape of the flower, negative space being the shape of that kind of the sky behind it. And I'm trying to be, one of the reasons I will kind of wipe that down is the lines themselves were getting a little bit heavy. And I want to start thinking in terms of value and mass um, as much as possible now. Um, it's going to add to the overall sense of realism if I eliminate the lines as much as possible because um, as we've mentioned before in the show, lines don't exist in nature. They're, um, they're symbols that we've invented to define the edge of an object. And lines are very important, um, but I, I think sometimes we default to line work um, and, and it can be helpful sometimes to think, well, what happens if we were to get rid of those? How would we construct the, the forms? How would we uh, manage edges? How would we create a sense of light and atmosphere? All right, so I, and one of the, the nice things about the vine charcoal is that it's so, um, it's so light that it makes it easy to kind of adjust the form, uh, you know, thinking about kind of adding and subtracting um, and using both those processes in the drawing process. So, um, so one of the things that's, that I'm observing is happening now is I'm starting to fixate on some of the finer elements. So as I'm working on this form here, for example, when you focus on a form, the nature of focus is that you ignore everything else. And so I'm looking at this and I'm ignoring everything else. And big, a big um, a kind of red flag that pops up then is that I start to lose an awareness of the scale and the placement of this relative to everything else. I'm losing the forest for the tree, right? And so I need to constantly step back and see, all right, well, I'm working on this form, but it needs to be in the context of everything else. Where is this relative to this form or to these other landmarks in the drawing? So you can create horizontal guides. So run, this, run a line across here and ask yourself, what elements in the flower would intersect with that horizontal line here or a plumb line that were to drop down here. Um, and so you can find, again, landmarks in the reference image that you can use and make sure that you're checking in and as you get focused on refining particular edges and shapes, keep doing a check-in where you are relative to other landmarks. So there's this shadow here. I can carry that, that angle through here and observe the placement of this relative to say this element down in here. So much of the drawing process is about splitting your awareness and being aware of many things at the same time or bouncing very quickly back and forth between various elements in the subject. Um, and it can feel slow and cumbersome at first, but the more you draw, the faster you, you'll get at processing all that information. And it'll start to become kind of second nature that you'll just kind of check in before you make a mark quick. Where are you relative to everything else? Um, and so I'm also thinking at this stage that there are these really kind of graceful edges you know, these little wavy edges along the whole outer edge of the flower that I'm fighting the urge to address right now <laughs> um, because they're really awesome and I want to kind of dig into them, but it's too early for that. All right. Now let me check the, um, check the height here compared to the width. I think we're in generally good shape. Um, looking at this negative space, maybe adjusting a little bit. And one of the things you can do too to help with the form 
is to kind of to, to divide the negative space up a little bit. So if you were to take a, a plumb line here, for example, a vertical line that a, a contacts the left side of this form, it creates a negative space. It might be a little bit easier to see if you were to close that off or you know, do something like this, draw a horizontal guide across here where you can start to observe this specific negative shape in here. Okay. <sighs> all right, welcome everybody. So um, thank you for all the kind comments, everybody. If you have any questions, uh, throw them out here. We've, we often get in, <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of go in some crazy directions sometimes. Uh, not crazy, but some bo uh, like really fun directions with some of the topics we, we touch upon in the show. So uh, sometimes we go outside of the realm of drawing specifically and, and discuss other art topics. But um, all right, so I'm just giving some slight indicators about this central form. Um, and you're just trying to observe that, that general shape. So we talk about positive and negative space. Now that we're inside the form, this can be treated as a positive space. The flower petals themselves can be treated as, as a negative space. And then as we're thinking about this as positive, that becomes negative. So sometimes that the concept of positive and negative space can get a little confusing as you have these forms that overlap. Um, but the, the general idea is to think about um, capturing the shape of, of anything in your drawing um, simultaneously as a positive shape, the shape itself, as well as the, the space that's formed around it. That, um, that can be helpful sometimes. So um, I kind of like what's happening in terms of the basic value structure. So you can see I've kind of created a vignette, darkening some of the outer edges um, and leaving this light. And with this dark shadow shape in here, and it's this really sharp edge kind of transitioning into these kind of graceful forms here. I kind of like the way it's bringing the eye in from the bottom up to the top. Um, and then I'll continue to play around with some of the, uh, the background values. Um, uh, Sue is asking, I enjoyed your artist interviews. Have you stopped those? Uh, we are in the process of trying to schedule out more of those. So the first two were a bit of a test and we have hopefully more coming on the, in the, on the way. Um, and it's just, it's one of the, one of the many things that we're working on. Uh, you know, many of the artists that we work with are, are rather busy. So we're kind of working around busy schedules and, and other things, but hopefully we'll be doing more of those in the open studios. So um, what, uh, what Sue is referring to is, um, you know, we have a membership on Artist Network. It's a membership site. Um, and uh, we, as a, as a uh, kind of, as a, I don't know what I'm referring to, um, as a feature for members, we started a series called Open Studio. So we had interviews. The first one with Aaron was with Aaron Schur, a landscape painter, and the next was with Ron Hicks, who does these really amazing uh, figurative uh, pieces that are kind of blended with abstraction. Uh, so at this point, when I've switched to the compressed charcoal, one of the I, I'm enjoying about using this this extender, this pencil holder, is that I, I really like a longer pencil, <laughs> and it just it allows me to control pressure in an interesting way. Um, so you can see I'm holding this way back at the very end, allowing the the side of the pencil to be engaged a bit more, um, and. Uh, and I can fill a broad area a bit more easily. And, and what I'm doing now is essentially just building up a more permanent layer of charcoal on top of the vine charcoal, which is uh, less permanent. And, and I like that sequence of the vine charcoal underneath to provide a kind of a, just a, a nice kind of a seasoned paper All right, kind of just building up some of the backgrounds and I'm not worried about the edges. So as part of the whole refinement process, 
The big thing that we're gonna be refining are edges. That's where the detail is conveyed. Um, and so as we talk about the difference between refinement and detail, that's, what, that's really what we're looking at is gradually refining these shapes, working out towards the edges to find things that are more specific and increasingly refined, kind of brought to a level of sharpness. Uh, the, so at this point, I'm intentionally leaving things very soft and atmospheric because then out of that, I can be selective with the focus in the drawing and I can control the viewer's gaze to some degree. I can align it with my own kind of impressions of the flower um, and, and create something that kind of captures a bit more of kind of who I am as an artist. Those are the decisions that we make. It's the decisions that we make in our art that really define us as artists. And so the decisions I make are going to be different than yours. Even if we're following along a fairly similar process, things about the flower are going to stand out to you that are different than what stands out to me. Um, and you're going to react to them in different ways. So you may, you may choose, for example, to exaggerate a certain form that's really standing out to you as kind of a, a caricature of the, the flower. You may choose to be um, more kind of photographic in your representation and really relying on the photo reference as uh, more than say somebody else. Um, or maybe this is just a launching off point and it's all about creating expressive mark and it's nothing to do really with the flower other than it gives you a direction of, in terms of your forms. Um, but this, again, this, if we kind of follow this process at, at every step along the way, you can allow your decisions to influence the drawing and let your, your kind of style and sensibility emerge. All right. Oh, Brenda saying, drawing flowers reminds me of the Chihuly exhibit. Yeah, Chihuly is amazing. I was, I lived out in Washington state for a while and there was the, the glass museum out there that was amazing to see. All right, so doing some subtractive drawing at this point. So I'm using this vanish eraser from, from Jerry's. Again, that's part of the, the materials giveaway. Um, and I'm thinking about, it's important to me to get the, the basic value structures established, light to dark to light to dark, etc. So where, where are we shifting from a, a dark relationship to light versus light to dark? Um, and this is a key element in here that I want to establish. And uh, so I'm bringing in the eraser to do that. So in general, this side of the flower is in shadow, but there's this one spot where the light comes out against that darker background. And then we come over here and I think what I want to do is actually darken that background a little bit to create a, kind of a, rever a reversal of that dynamic where now this is going to be lighter than that. So we have darker to lighter and then lighter to darker. Yeah, and it, I'm not thinking about um, absolute value at this point. I'm just thinking about value relationships. And then we'll, we'll kind of dial that in as we go. And we talked about that in one of the past episodes recently is that one of the unique things about value is that it's always determined in the context of the whole scene. Value is always a relationship. There's, we don't have the ability to observe a precise value um, in isolation from its surroundings. It's, if there's, you know, if we think about perfect pitch in music, somebody who has perfect pitch can hear a note, just a straight note and say, that's an E, that's an F, etc. cetera. Um, me, I don't have that. So I kind of have to he hear that in the sequence of, of the song to understand those tonal relationships. And, and it, uh, we don't, as humans, as far as I know, based on the, the reading that I've done, we don't have an equivalent visually. So, um, you know, when we, when we see a value, it's always affected by, by its environment, by its relationships, and we're calibrating our understanding of the value to that relationship. So what is, what we, un, we interpret as, as light can be made dark by affecting the values around it and then, and vice versa. So, 
All right, let's see. Hello, Mia. Welcome. I see some new names. Again, welcome everybody. Uh, if are you anybody drawing along with? If you are new, you're gonna to want to know that you can find the reference image. It's a link in the description below, and as well, it's got the list of the materials I'm using. Um, you don't have to be using the same materials as me for um, for sure, because it's all about just us getting together to draw. But um, if it's helpful to you to know what I'm working with, you'll find that there. Um, so going back to the concept of value relationships, one of the things I'm thinking about right here is that I know that there's going to be darker areas, the, the darkest darks in those shadows, like this crease along in here, um, is going to change the way I interpret this value here. So I have to kind of move forward with a certain amount of faith that, uh, that the, the values that I'm working with are, are going to um, change as we go. I, I can't be thinking permanently about anything in this drawing at this point. All right. Mad Moments Go is watching now and we'll draw later. Awesome. All right. Doing some subtractive drawing in here. So, so the, the other aspect that you know we talk about that a lot in this show is, you know, every everything is an opportunity to contribute to the form. You know, sometimes we just have to lift off a mistake on the page. Um, but you always want to be thinking about how can that, how can whatever I'm using, whatever tool I'm using, how can that help me to define the form. So when you pick up an eraser, an eraser is a tool for correcting mistakes, but this is an opportunity now to kind of define one of these edges here. Uh, the other thing that I have to be mindful of is the fact that I do have white charcoal available to me that's going to pull out highlights even more, because I'm starting to calibrate to this. I'm starting to see this as white, um, even though it's a relatively dark tone. And so if I bring this out, for example, you can see how much brighter that is. Um, and sometimes you kind of just kind of need to refresh your brain a little bit. So bring out a, a sheet of white paper to compare to it and kind of recalibrate your understanding of the values. Um, hello, Lisa. Excellent. Welcome. Karen, I'm glad to hear that you're learning as well. So that is my, it makes me happy. My, my genuine hope out of this is that people just draw because I think drawing is awesome. And not just as a way to make an image, but I think it's really an essential tool for processing our world. It's been such a valuable thing for me um, that I want to want to share that. All right, what do I need to do now? Okay, so we've got the major forms here, and now when we think about refinement, um, I'm going to be thinking about moving from the center of the form outward rather than the outer edge inward, uh, and that's going to give me a little bit more control over. Uh, the, the line work. So the way I'm going to tackle this, you can see that this is largely undefined at this point. Um, I, what I'm going to do is actually kind of start at the outer edges. So I'm going to sharpen up, uh, sharpen up an edge along in here. And then to give myself a kind of a more precise form, And let me see, there's some, this is where I can really start to explore some of these, these cool kind of scalloped edges of the poppy. So we start to refine that edge using the kind of the ghostly image below it as a, as a tool. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump down here and I'm just gonna keep bouncing back and forth uh, and then kind of in towards the middle so rather than thinking um, of starting at one point and then moving down, I want to be moving back and forth because that helps me to address what I was talking about earlier of that 
uh, the, the danger that exists when I, when I hyper-focus too much. Um, when, when you think about it as, uh, as, we, as we move from one part to the next in a linear progression, as we go, we start to lose sight of those relationships and it's really easy to get off track. But if you do a little bit over here and then you jump to another part of the drawing, um, making sure that your, the, the spatial relationships are correct, um, then it helps you to kind of shorten the gap. You're shortening up these distances between those forms um, and you can feel more confident that those details that you're adding are going to, um, are gonna, are gonna hold up. They're, they're gonna, um, you're not gonna lose sight of the, the path that you need to be along there. So kind of giving myself a little bit of a, kind of a sharpened edge there. In this, this case here, finding the edge and kind of lifting inward or starting from the, the center of the form. So kind of being aware of where that edge might be and stopping short along the path rather than drawing a line. But sometimes it's helpful to actually lightly draw in an edge so you can see it and then build values up to it. And so there's this shadow that's being cast. We've got two shadow types here. We've got the form shadow. This petal, petal is in, it, it itself is in shadow and then is casting a shadow and they combine together to create the shadow shape. So what I'm trying to do now is, is I need to regroup a little bit and observe the shadow shape. That's the combination of the two. And then we're gonna go th into that shape and divide that farther so that we can distinguish between the, the petal that's, that's in shadow and then the shadow that it's casting on the petal below it. Oh, well, my saying, yes, yeah, it is difficult to, to multitask, you know, that we don't, we're not really designed as humans to technically multitask. What happens is we get really good at jumping around, moving from one decision to the next very quickly. So, um, but it doesn't always work out that way. All right, so I've got a few areas now that are starting to get refined. Um, I'm gonna to move to another, um, and I, I don't quite know what's happening at this edge here, so I'm gonna leave that a little bit more ambiguous here. So one of the things that I've found is that a shadow can feel more convincing when, it's, when, when you really pay attention to the direction of your marks. So this shadow right here, you could interpret it as a kind of a specific line. If I were to draw my mark, have my marks run in parallel with that line, what can sometimes happen is it can feel like, it can feel like it's just gonna jump off the page. Because uh, we talked about lines a little bit earlier, that lines we understand as symbols for an edge. And in this case, we are seeing an edge of an object. But it's also, in this case, that dark mark is a shadow and it's attached to that petal underneath it. And so by changing the direction of your marks, it can, it can reinforce the plane of that petal and it's a visual cue to the viewer that they actually belong together, right? That that, that dark mark is actually a shadow on that form rather than a separate form altogether. Uh, it's one of the things that I've, um, I've had to kind of help uh, beginning drawers through is, um, is that kind of unifying the drawing. So it, like, whenever, you, whenever you make a mark, you're creating a division on the page. And if there's too much contrast, if, it, if those divisions are too intense, it gets difficult for the viewer to understand the subject. It takes a lot of mental energy to try to solve that puzzle for the viewer. So we as artists are trying to make that easy for the viewer 
Um, and simply changing the direction of your marks can sometimes go a long way in, um, in helping that viewer. So as I see this shadow down in here, for example, I'm trying to visualize the path that that shadow would follow along, but then create it as a sequence of short marks that move to reinforce the plane of that larger petal. So here, as I, as I draw this thin shadow to prevent it from reading like a line as a, as a division on that surface, I'm just trying to find that path, but I'm moving the pencil slightly left and right and then just dragging down along that path. And it starts to create a line that reads more like a shadow. Also getting the value relationships correct can be helpful as well. If there's too much contrast, sometimes those marks can jump off the page and be read as contour lines rather than, um, rather than shadows. Using the side of the pencil can help as well. You can see that I haven't used the, the tip of the pencil at, really at all. I'm using this kind of modified overhand grip. And then as you can see then, as we're doing it, what we're doing is we're jumping around from dark mark to dark mark, placing those. And then we, now we have a smaller division that we can focus on. So now I can kind of focus on more on those details those refined edges a little bit more easily. And I don't have to worry that if I'm off a little bit in this section that it's gonna throw off everything in the flower. So um, one of the nice things about this as, a, as an object is that it's, it is a little bit forgiving. If you get the main forms correct, you're gonna be in good shape. But you know, if, you, if, I, you know, if I have these shadow shapes uh, kind of incorrectly placed by a little bit, it's not gonna make a huge difference. All right, thank you, Barb. I appreciate the comments. Um, all right, it's great to see, great to see new people joining us all the time. Again, we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Of course, last week we didn't, kind of, but I try to get a recording up every week, at least. Um, I really like the live portions far better than the recorded ones. All right. Okay, so and it may seem scattered, but again, I'm kind of I'm intentionally jumping around the flower here to to not. Um, not get fixated too much on, on an, any particular point in the drawing. So this is cool, this, this eraser here that's it's in that, that giveaway kit. It's just a sanded eraser that I can, I can use to file down I kind of had given myself kind of a, too much of a stump. I need more of a I need a broader surface there. So this is still, I'm using a 2B um, charcoal pencil at this point. All right, so as I discover this stre stretch in here, I'm gonna do kind of a mental pass, giving some kind of slight notes as we go along. It's so easy to get lost uh, in, in the details. I was out uh, painting the mountains here in Colorado the other day, and you know you get all of these peaks along the ridge here in the front range. And it's so, it's so easy to kind of look at the painting and then look up at the ridge and kind of lose track of where all the, like, the specific peaks are. Um, and that's the same thing is happening in here. Um, so, I, they need to kind of slow down a little bit. But again, if I, if I know that I'm working in a defined area, if I'm off with some of the proportions in this stretch, again, it's not gonna throw off the proportions in the entire drawing.
And I, I'm thinking right now that there's part of this that I'm going to have to lift up with an eraser, but I don't want to do that yet. I'm going to, I'm going to build in some of the darks first because often what I've done is I've, um, I start to correct the values too early. And, you know, uh, I'll think, oh, something's too dark, so I'll lighten it up. And then later on realize that actually it was right. I just didn't have the proper value relationship established. I needed, I needed additional darks to help put those original ones in context. Um, and so as I'm working on the edges here, I, I try to just kind of tap along the edges as much as possible. If I'm heavy with line here, I run the risk of it kind of losing the delicacy of the flower. So I'm intentionally, I want those edges to be delicate. Letting some of those edges disappear. Cindy, that's a great comment. I go to the blending stump when I feel like I'm staying in one spot and, and too much detail. That's a great observation. I, um, I need to pull out that blending stump in a little bit, but I'm gonna continue to refine some of these edges. In this case, I'm gonna use the blending stump to help more with the texture by capturing the, the subtle, um, shadow shapes that are forming uh, you know within you know within each of those petals you get all of these variations so and then one of the things that you can start to also pay attention to is kind of the broad value keys in in each element right so when you think about value in the, in the key, the key is really like the, the, the core value range that you're dealing with. So you have low key, very dark values, high key, very light. Um, and in a drawing that has a full range of values would, you know, have, may have sections within it that have, um, you might have a low key area and a high key area. So if I'm looking over here, for example, it's a lower key, it's a darker set of values. Over here, it's gonna be a lighter set of values. And it can be helpful sometimes to create those divisions so that the darkest dark here might be actually lighter in value than the lightest part over here. Um, so there's, I'm kind of thinking about it in those terms here to create um, a kind of a, a um, what am I trying to articulate here? It, it, if without that, it's basically helping me to, to provide structure in those values. Without that, um, if I have the same level of contrast over here as I do over here, it can sometimes be f difficult for the viewer to make sense of. There's a bit too much contrast. Now this, this section up here is really tricky because I'm observing that the value relationship in the reference is very similar between the background and the edge of the flower. You know, it's highly visible because we have that shift in hue. And so if I was painting this, it would be a little bit easier to, to manage that relationship. So now I'm trying to figure out how do I manage that in terms of value? I want to let that be subtle. I can always, I can always expand that, that contrast later. So right now, I, since I don't really know what I want to do with it, I'm just going to kind of let that sit for a little bit. Um, so there's a kind of a landmark in this petal over here. I'm going to place in, I'm just doing a quick check in. And then I can, I can close this gap here. So now I'm actually going to shift to drawing that background, kind of move back and forth from the outer space, outer edges of that space to, to that edge. So I'm just kind of like tapping along that edge to help define that so I can visualize where that is. But again, not drawing that line. You know who draws flowers amazingly? <laughs> 
is Kathleen Speranza. I don't know if anybody's observed her work. Check hers out. I know she's got some videos that are coming out, but some mind-blowing um, paintings and drawings. Um, and she really is, it's a great way to learn about how to control edges if you take a look at her work. And it's Kathleen Speranza. She's a, every time I look at her work, I'm like, what? How does she do that? <laughs> so good. So many great artists out there. Uh, you can get a little overwhelming sometimes. All right, so now as I'm coming down this edge here, um, I feel like this is generally the kind of the last area that I really need to kind of refine a little bit. Um, and as I say that, my eye caught something up in here, kind of partly to delay the stretch because in the preparatory drawing, this was the hardest part of the drawing, was this one little stretch on this pedal. And I don't know why that is. I think there, there was part of me that wanted to um, just kind of create a wavy mark that's not very specific. And, and I did that <laughs> in my preparatory one. Um, and I kind of chastised myself a little bit. And so I want to try to learn from, I want to learn from that a little bit more. Uh, so, but where it's tricky because again, we have very subtle value relationships. And so as I'm going through, as I'm looking at all of the little nooks and crannies, all these little wavy marks. Um, I'll lighten this up a little bit so I have more of an edge to, to manage. Um, as I'm going through, I'm going to do a quick check-in. Where am I relative to other forms? And I think what kind of got me is along this edge, trying to alternate that relationship. So like right in here, for example, making this one little bump darker than the background here. But then coming up over here, now this gets lighter and it's, it's such, a, such a subtle and tricky thing, but I think it can really, that's what's going to capture the, the light, the, the delicacy of this flower is paying attention to those those subtle value relationships. And so now I'm gonna, now in the reference photo, there's actually, there are some of those flowers in the distance that are creating these value relationships. And I don't think I want to address those, but I can, I can kind of lighten up that background just a little bit in some areas. And then this gets a little bit tricky in here um, as, as these two petals kind of merge in that one spot. And then you have this one that's really projecting straight out at us and it creates this really odd abstract shape. Um, but the, the, the shapes that we create here can, can really, that, that's what's ultimately going to um, to really create that depth. It's important that we create this this petal here as a shelf that we're looking across at. Um, it, that, it puts this here, the center of the flower, in the bowl of the, that poppy. So as I'm going through this, I'm just now trying to think about, in an abstract way, the shape of the darks. So I think I'm at the point now where I need to get the blending stump out. How's everybody doing? Whew. Gotta kind of shake it off a little bit. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Uh, um, 
the I uh, see I so those of you typing in, in all caps thank you for doing that um, it helps me to identify questions uh, let's see but Karen has a question about the um, uh, Mitian's paper I don't know which side of the paper to use off the I, it's been a long time since I've used it um, but I'm trying to think of through we filmed with Desmond O'Hagan a pastel artist who um, uses that paper a lot and uh, and I'm trying to think of what he recommended. <laughs> um, all right, so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of refining this shadow shape here. Again, it's the combination of the form shadow of this petal and the cast shadow on the petal below it. And kind of starting with the ed from the center of the form, working my way out. Um, kind of refine that shape using the blending stump. And I'm just creating an average value here because I'm going to be able to go darker to add the, the range of values that's going to bring this to life. So I'm just really kind of blocking it in at this point. Um, ooh, Heathers, can I explain the difference between nitrum charcoal and generals? I can't. I don't know the difference. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Is I? That's a really good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to play around with that a little bit. Um, that it gets into a level of nuance that I haven't um, really considered. So that's a really good question. Is that something that you use? Which one do you use? Um, I mean, I do notice I've got, um, like here, for example, I've got this Faber-Castell um, pit charcoal. There's a slight difference in, in temperature and smoothness. So I, I mean, in general, when you're, when you're there's a pun there, um, in general, when you're thinking about charcoal, you're, the, the things that I observe have to do with temperature, either it's warm or it's cool. Um, or it's kind of smoothness. It's either going to be scratchy or it's going to be soft. Um, and you kind of want to use, um, you want to be kind of comfortable with both. There are going to be times when you're going to need something that's kind of scratchier and harder, and there's going to be times when you're going to need it softer. Um, but specifically nitrum versus generals, I don't really know the difference. Um, so much of the time is, is kind of adapting to what the materials that I have in front of me. Um, so... Uh, Brent does art. You may not need the white charcoal for this one. That's perhaps, um, but I'm excited to, to, to see if I can pop that tonal range a little bit by working with some of that white charcoal. We'll see what happens. Um, all right, so what I'm doing now with this blending stump, this is a well-used blending stump. You can see it's loaded with charcoal, um, and that allows me to not only smooth the areas that I've got, so it helps to fill in some of the tooth of the paper, um, but you can see that I'm, I'm trying to do that in a way that, again, reinforces the form of the, of the flower. So thinking about there's, there are the planes of the petals, and then there's kind of the finer texture as well. And um, so I'm kind of drawing with it and um, and smoothing at the same time. Now, one of the things that I, I think was helpful for me to observe in the preparatory drawing is that um, there can be kind of these triangular crinkles. There's one right up here, for example, where there's like a fold in the petal, and that can be helpful to observe. And so as you start to look at the um, kind of the details in here, keep thinking larger to smaller. So we started with the large form here, and now we're just getting into smaller and smaller areas. But even within this, we have kind of larger bends and forms that we can address. And then within, within those, there's going to be some variation that we can extract a little bit more information from. So... Um,
and in general, the, the more you focus on the larger forms, the, I think generally the better. Um, if, if you add kind of refinement or details it, without that underlying form, or in, 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 and this is why I kind of like to talk about the difference between details and refinement, is that when I, when I think about detail, it feels like an element, like an embellishment that's placed on top. And if that's not in service of the form, if it's not reinforcing the form, the shape, the volume of the subject, then it, it all kind of sprinkles to the surface and it becomes visually confusing for the viewer. Uh, they have to, the viewer then has to go through the process of making sense of it. Um, and, and it can sometimes not hold up. And so you always want to be thinking about what's happening to that form. All right, so as we come across here, for example, we have this one petal that kind of scoops up like a bowl and then it bends at the top. And, and sometimes like there's just so much happening in the small area. Um, I, I don't really have time to, to really think deeply about that one section and work out all the individual and very specific lines. And so I'm just going to hold that, that general quality in my mind and try to at least capture that, you know, through a series of kind of gestural marks. Uh, so there are these kind of lines that, that scoop down. And then again, it comes up and then bends. And I'm going to use an eraser to pull out some of those lights, but I'm not going to do that quite yet. I'm not ready for that, so I'm going to... Um, focus on just working on the darks. Don't forget to look at the reference. Kind of had to remind myself a little bit there. It's so easy that for me, mark making can be so seductive that it's so easy to get sucked into just that, just the mark making, and kind of lose sight of the fact that we're, we're, we're using the drawing process to better understand the world around us, right? And so, we, um, if we got to keep coming back to that reference in, in the idea that the, the better we understand the subject, the better our drawing's going to be, and the but at the same time, it's again that drawing process that gets us to that point. They feed one another, and so what the drawing itself becomes is a record of the struggle that our brain has gone through to really understand this particular flower. Um, that's why, again, I, why I think drawing is so powerful because it's a way for us to spend time with the things that we love, right? You know, the things that kind of capture our attention. Um, and the, you know, we can slow down and we can start to appreciate uh, some of the things that we overlook That's why I like sometimes like a, you know, a portrait can be so powerful or, um, you know, still lives of objects that are meaningful to us can, can carry a lot of powers because you can kind of sense the, um, you know, sense the, the interest and the devotion to understanding the form that the artist has given to it. Generally, I, I struggle with that, that tripod grip. I switch, I'm switching to this overhand grip here. And so part of using the, the blending stump is kind of, is kind of understanding, kind of having an, in, an intuition of where the charcoal is loaded on the, on the end. So as, I, as I'm drawing with it, it can, um, it's depositing charcoal. Um, and so then if I need, if I need a darker mark, I just need to kind of roll to another part of the, of the stump that is a little bit more loaded. Uh, 
Uh, part of this technique too is also paying attention to where, where the pressure is applied to the paper. So uh, in most of these marks, there's a bit of a scooping quality. You're landing gently on the surface. You're kind of lifting off a little bit. You're flicking it up um, rather than stopping sharp and hard and that to create kind of a, a hard edge. Um, but kind of pushing and pulling it, dragging it, moving it in a variety of different directions to vary those marks. Just and it, this is where my my talking starts to slow down because I'm focusing a little bit more. So um, well, I love that comment. It's helped you to see. Uh, that makes me very happy to hear. Um, there's you know seeing is really fascinating when you when you kind of study it. I've talked about this, it's been a while since I kind of mentioned it, but the, my understanding of the visual process is that, you know, as light enters our eyes, it passes through the lens, hits the retina, where those, the vibrating photons are, um, they, they activate the photoreceptive cells on the retina that translate those vibrations into an electrical signal that goes to, through the optic nerve into our brain. Um, and then there, that electrical signal has to be interpreted. So um, our brain is looking at this frequency, this vibration of um, light that's been translated into electricity um, and it's got to make sense of it and it, it, that in the, the brain is creating the creating the image. Um, the and there are kind of levels in the visual process that, that that interpretation kind of passes through. So the, the first level is, um, is really kind of the pure level of just, just the object. It's just light, it's just raw data. And then um, from there it moves to a higher level of, of um, thinking that starts to define it. You apply labels and names. It says this is a flower, this is the sky, this is uh, such and such, right? Um, and and maybe what you do with it, right? You know, it's it's a this is a pencil. You pick it up and you make marks with it, right? Um, and then the highest level there that it passes through is kind of the emotional thing. It's just like the it's kind of the the emotional highlight. Maybe you have a memory of this or um, a particular feeling about it. Um, it's kind of making use of the, of it. Um, and we often kind of jump. And many times we'll stay on that high level of thinking that's built on that raw data. So what we're doing as artists is we're getting back to that raw data. We're, we're taking time to sit with that higher level, immediate understanding, recognition that this is a poppy. And we're slowing everything down to understand how did we get to that point? And then we're building the drawing from that. So we're kind of reverse engineering that whole visual process in such a way that hopefully we end up with a flower that a, that a viewer will come in and will look at this drawing and immediately say flower. Their brain will go through the exact same steps that they would if they were seeing this in real life. And, uh, and that's, again, one of the things I just love about drawing and um, in that it's a, it's a tool for us to get to that point. So, so much of it is, it's, again, one of the things that we like to, to question is, is the difference between drawing, the act of drawing that we're all taking part in and the drawing, which is the object itself. And there are sometimes as artists where it's gonna to have to be all about the drawing. We're doing it for a client or there's a specific, specific reason where we just need to focus on it as an object. Um, and then sometimes where it's, it's, about, it's about drawing, it's the action. And we're letting the result just be a, an expression, an understanding of that, of that process. This is just like footprints that we're going through and that kind of demonstrate the, the process of our cognition. Yeah. 
And that's where I think, you know, drawing from life can be really helpful. It's certainly not the only style of art out there, um, but it can be helpful in that regard to kind of connect us with that part of ourselves. All right, so I'm going through and I'm thinking about edges, trying to understand where the edges are starting to get softer or harder, where we, like if I look here, for example, I have that dark shape and I have that light shape. Are they feeling like separate forms or are they feeling like varying values, light and shadow on a singular form? And so by paying attention to the, that transition in values, that's what's going to either unify those elements or divide them. Okay. Uh, with this blending stump, I am going to start to indicate you know, what's happening here in the center of the flower. And going back to kind of the, the, the focus on seeing, how you squint your eyes, how you open them, how you let your eyes lose focus and come into focus can all play a role um, and so when I'm when I'm looking at the drawing when I'm looking at the reference I'm constantly bringing things in and out of focus I'm opening my eyes wide to flood them with light I'm squinting to to limit the amount of light and and every time you're doing that you're you're just gaining more kind of perspectives on, on, the, on the subject. Um, it's, you know, you're, you're seeing value relationships in a new way or forms, shapes. Um, you know, some things stand out in higher contrast when you focus deeply on them. And then when you squint your eyes, they, you, you, you see those value relationships differently. So um, it, by varying that, you're just hopefully coming to a more objective understanding of the form. All right, so right in here, there, again, there's that petal that's moving back like a shelf, and the center of the flower is casting a shadow there. So I'm gonna focus on that shadow. There's a shadow being cast in along here. So using the blending stump still, just kind of rolling it to make sure I have um, a, an area on the blending stump that's active, that's, got, that's loaded with charcoal. And there are these forms in here in these petals. So for example, this one right here, um, it rolls. So it catches light in here, and then it rolls around where it gets a little bit darker, moves away from the light. And so as I find that path, I'm kind of blending in to create a softer edge on the inside of that form, a sharper edge on the outer. And in general, there's kind of a grain to these petals that that I'm trying to follow along that kind of radiate outward. You're just kind of placing and dragging, lifting upward. You're gonna create that soft transition. And then I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna pull out the eraser in a little bit and do some, do some lifting of the details. Ooh, I've got this, Got this electric eraser and I kind of filed it down. I just on some some uh, sandpaper. I uh, filed that down. So this is in that that kit of drawing materials that you can enter to that were given away. No. Oh no. Why did it do that? Okay, whoo, <laughs> it says they have a decent battery. Um, so it shouldn't die on me, but. All right, so now as, I, as I'm looking at this, I'm just, 
uh, there's kind of an element of pressure to this. Now, if you don't have a kind of a sharp eraser like this, you can use a big, you know, I've got this big rubber eraser and I just kind of sharpened it a little bit. It gave a nice sharp edge. Um, you don't have to have fancy tools, but they sure are fun. <laughs> um, actually, so I'm gonna stick with this larger one for now. Uh, so adding a little bit of detail by lifting off some of these areas. Now, um, it, it, in here, for example, there's this fold in the petal, and I can change the angle, the direction of those eraser marks to create a subtle kind of division there. So just kind of creating a sharp edge along there, lifting up, kind of changing the direction of the marks just slightly. I'm glad that, I hope the camera doesn't, cut out on me again. I don't know what was going on there. All right. Now, one of the things that I'm now observing that I, I didn't really sit with very well earlier with is um, the way the light is, and it's, ca it's catching on the, the bowl of the, the poppy there. It's strongest right in here. And so I'm kind of emphasizing that a little bit so kind of rocking the uh, eraser back and forth a little bit and just trying to emphasize putting a little bit more pressure on this section and then that and that creates this kind of darker halo Ooh. this isn't the kit too this little vacuum but it creates that little darker halo um, that will then help the, the the center of the flower kind of stand out um, and I'm intentionally saying the word center of the flower because I can't remember <laughs> the terms that I learned in you know, ninth grade biology or sciences or whatever that class was. I apologize. Apologize to my high school teachers that I didn't retain that knowledge. <laughs> um, I'm sure you all can help me out with that. Um, and right in here, there's actually kind of a really defined edge that I want to want to work with. Just kind of tapping along that edge. This little eraser is one of those tools that I didn't know I needed until I got it. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I need this now. It's a lot of fun. Um, oh, for crying out loud. Case. I don't know why it's doing that. And again, because it says it's got full battery or most, most of the battery. So I apologize for the confusion. Anybody who's new and watching this, I would like to say that this doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen all the time, but happens more than I'd like it to, that technology gets in the way. But if, if it does cut out, I mean, I feel like we've seen a lot of the drawings so far. And I don't know if there's a whole lot more that I can really provide, but um, I, then I, I will post the final version on Artist Network on the on the show page. Again, you can find that in the description below. Oh, no. Okay. All right, I just changed the settings a little bit, see if this helps. Um, I apologize, the video quality just dropped because I went to a, um, set it to a different setting on the camera itself. Okay, it look great now.
All right, back to this. <laughs> My bad. Um, oh, uh, the handheld vacuum. Yeah, this is in that kit that you'll find. So if you follow that link that I pinned to the top, it'll take you to the giveaway, and there's information about what that is. But this is it's called an Accurate, um, and it's a little vacuum cleaner that <laughs> is awesome. Um, so um, that's in there. That's a, one that Jerry's provided. Thank you, Jerry's. Okay, actually, I'm going to switch to, I really like this, this eraser here. It's called a Vanish Eraser. Um, and I'm tr I want to make sure, again, we're thinking about value keys that we were talking about earlier, that I'm not increasing the contrast too much on this section of the flower. So as I look for that variation, I still want that to be relatively dark in there to create that, that contrast. Um, let's see. And then this is where, you know, we're gonna make these small marks in here, but the direction and the, the scale of these marks can make a difference. So. I, I notice for here, for example, this section here, that's one petal that then wraps around and then we're going across at this one here. So it's not just one kind of form here. There's, there's a, a, an element of, of this, this plane that's leading away from us. And so what, what I wanna do is try to divide that up a little bit. Um, So change up the direction of the marks along that edge. Try to sharpen that edge a little bit. Pistol stamen, thank you, <laughs> Genius62. That's the word that was in my head that was elusive, and I did not want to make a fool of myself by... I, I, I should have been more open and vulnerable to making mistakes because you guys are so helpful with that. Um, is and so what I'm doing is I'm just I'm lifting with the eraser to create those highlights and then noticing they're too strong so then just kind of tapping them out kind of lightly addressing them and one of the the things is that there's a part of the drawing process that I, I really dig which is when it, it takes on a three-dimensional form and there's something that happens in the brain where you start to see this as three-dimensional on this two-dimensional surface. That's the magic of drawing, right? Is, or art in general that's representational is that, that, that idea that you're looking, at, you're looking at charcoal, you're looking at oil, pigment, and it's on a two-dimensional surface, but your brain says it's three-dimensional. You know, there's that, it's a really cool tension there um, that I don't think I'll ever get tired of um, kind of appreciating um, but there's a process in the drawing there's a part in the drawing process where you start to see that and as you're making your marks it's not just working on a two-dimensional surface but you feel like you're actually carving you're moving things in and around space and, and I, I just I really enjoy that that part and I hope it's something that you all do as well Actually, bring this. No. So again, I, I'm still on kind of working under the understanding that I don't have my darkest darks established yet. There are areas that I've kind of averaged out the values, and then they're, they're so they're appearing darker 
than they actually are. And then once I once I build in the darkest darks, it'll put them into context a little bit better. So as I'm working on this stretch in here, it's recognizing that it's, again, that pedal is kind of curving out. Um, and so we're seeing that front edge and then it scoops down, it gets obscured um, from our view. And then it, we start to see the inside of that curve emerge back in here. To, I need to sharpen up this edge in some areas. So I'm just kind of smoothing out this background here. This has been a lot of fun, this drawing here. Um, how's everybody else going? Oh, Greg, thank you. The comments about the, the contrast. I'm kind of curious. Let me see how this... Yeah, that's the first one. That's... Um, yeah, everything's a bit darker here. I want to pop the contrast a little bit by adding the lights. Um, uh, and then Jessica is asking, what paper am I using? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you open up the description below, um, I have it listed up there. It's a Legion paper, it's a rag paper, and it's a slightly gray toned. Um, I, I just can't remember the specific name of it, and I don't want to be incorrect with it. Um, all right, so. I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come in with my darker darks. So I'm going to swap out this 2B, no, it's a 4B, with my little nubbins of a 6B. Um, put that in my extender here. And now what I'm going to look for is, you know, kind of some variation in the shadows. And that's what's going to help with the transparency. I can sharpen up some of the edges. But break up those sections there. So you can see that I didn't do one line across the whole thing. I kind of just brought in some darks in a few select areas. And so by going a little bit darker in here, it's changing, it's affecting the, the context of the, uh, affecting the context of the, um, the values that I had established before. Um, it bothers me so that there's so, it feels like it's so out of focus. All right. I don't know if that really helped or not, but my camera decided it's not going to cooperate so well today. That's all right. It's done, it's done a lot of these and it's treated me well so far. Um, too much variation in there, so just kind of, um, kind of blocking in values there. I'm kind of trying to. We talked about this before. There's this, there's this tension in the drawing between variety and unity. Every time you make a mark, it creates a division on the page, that then the viewer has to make sense of. Um, and so then sometimes we have to unify them. Sometimes there's too much contrast. And so we're, we're constantly um, managing that, that relationship between variety, which is exciting, but it also can be visually confusing, and unity, which holds everything together. But if there's too much unity, it can be boring. So. I think in general I have a bias towards unity, so I might I might flatten things a little bit too much sometimes. Alright, as I come in through here, 
looking for some variation. Here we get all of these folds. So they kind of really kind of snakes around on top of itself. Sorry, I'm kind of just focusing on that one area a bit intently. And then right in here is where we're really going to try to pull that out. So um, you can see in the reference photo, there's some bounce light happening in that cast shadow. So we have the form shadow of that petal that's getting that's relatively dark. It's casting a shadow on the petal below it, but there's light catching inside here as well. That's in it. There's kind of a translucent quality to that cast shadow. So if I kind of if I lift this and now come back in with um, with a darker dark, that should hopefully create some of that bounce light. Actually, I'm going to use a kneaded eraser to create a kind of sharp point and lift off some of here where the light is catching. So I'm giving a little bit more emphasis to this one petal, and I don't know why. It's just kind of my, that's just what my intuition is telling me is to focus on this, but that may be something that you choose to diminish in your drawing. So again, we're thinking about, again, refining edges, not adding detail. I want to see if I can switch this back and see if it will hold up because I think it's just a better view. There we go. Now that's the video camera setting versus the photo setting that was not quite as strong. So that's a little bit better, but hopefully it's not going to kind of give out on me. How's that? It's a little bit too dark of a line there, so I want to feather this out a little bit. A little bit lighter on the inside. So I created that bounce light again by darkening the areas around it rather than lifting out um, it with an eraser. Now I just want to be kind of selective with the line. So I'm just going to go around the edge and bring in a sharp line just in areas where I want to kind of draw a little bit more attention. And so this is generally primarily drawn with the side of the pencil and you can allow that pencil to kind of roll in your fingers to get a kind of a sharper edge. And, and again, I want to be selective with where I drop that line in because if I, if I create a hard line all the way around it, it might, actually, it might create an interesting kind of graphic quality, um, but it also runs the risk of it losing a sense of delicacy and form. It may end up flattening it out. So. But this is where, again, you can be in the driver's seat in your own work. Maybe you say, hey, I like the... Um, I like the idea of, 
a stronger contour line in certain areas. All right, so now let's bring out the let's bring out the light. So in order to add the light, the white charcoal, I need to kind of erase. I need to lift off some of the charcoal underneath it. You can kind of leave the charcoal on there, but when it mixes with the white, it can end up being kind of a, a silvery gray quality. We talked about temperature a little bit earlier. That would affect the temperature. So the um, it, it end up could end up being cooler. So I'm thinking about these little the round, the pistol or the stamen aspects that I can't remember. Um, so you have like these thin lines leading up. And then you have those kind of pads at the top. And I'm not, I'm not going to worry about getting each and every one of them Right. I just I want to get an, an overall sense of, of it. Think more gesturally at this point. Um, but this is where again, if you if you're so inclined, you can sit with this and really dig into the details of these um, you know, these various elements. So so I'm kind of lifting off those areas, and then those are going to be areas where. Um, I can add the white. So let me bring this. Here's my white charcoal. And actually, I can, I don't need to attach it to the, um, the extender there. So I'm just thinking about where the lightest lights are. So where is it capturing the most? And kind of starting from there. I don't need that tip. Otherwise, it would have broken off on me if I needed it. Um, so yeah, we're just now in the kind of the final stages of adding the lightest lights. And one of the things that I, I think about when, again, it, so much of it is, is determining where do you refine farther, right? And we each have our own sensibilities with regards to that. Um, one of the things that I use as a metric is, is an understanding of when I, when I first encountered this reference image, what attracted me? Where did my eye go first? Um, and for me, it went here, not in the center. And so by recognizing that, it kind of gives me a guide that I can use to determine, well, where do I want to add the detail? So I'm going to add the detail to the spots that initially grab my attention, and, and I'm going to add, you know, refine those areas further, and then leave the, the secondary um, areas less refined. Um, and so, but I need, to, I need to bring this up to a, a point where it doesn't feel like it's distracting and it's limited refinement. So try to find that balance between having just enough detail, just enough refinement, uh, but not so much that it disrupts the and ex being the expression of, of how I naturally um, kind of observed this um, subject. There's a spot here where the shadow seems to kind of pass through. All right, now I'm going to bring this out and just bring out some highlights right in here. So just using the side of the, pen, the pencil here, again, just kind of lightly kind of scraping along to help try to reinforce the texture a little bit. So I'm glad 
Uh, the camera seems to be cooperating now. I got it back to where it's supposed to be in the proper settings. So it should be a bit more accurate based you know, compared to what I'm seeing in front of me here. Uh, right in here, this is where I want to bring in the, there's a light on the end, the top side of that leaf or the petal, I mean. And I can kind of sharpen that edge just a bit. Um, but I don't know about you guys, but I feel, I feel like this was a, a fun but, but challenging struggle. <laughs> My brain's a bit shot. We're coming up on two hours, so um, I think we're just about ready here. Um, there's some there's some elements right in here where you get some uh, bounce light, so it's reflecting on these top edges here a bit of the sky. And so when you look closely, you see them, um, but when you squint your eyes, they disappear. So that's a clue that the value relationship is actually pretty narrow. So when I work on here, I can add a little bit of refinement by just kind of gently tapping, uh, and and hopefully it keeps that contrast down a little bit. It provides a little bit more structure. And again, a little bit more refinement without it uh, overwhelming the senses by being just being having too much contrast in there. So, all right. Well, how's everybody doing? How are your drawings? Everybody happy with your work? I look forward to seeing them. If you could share them on. Artist Network, again, if, if you're new, you're going to want to know that you can find the, the link to the show page in the description. And you can, it'll take you right there, and you can see the work, and you can add your, um, add your own drawing to the discussion. So what I'm doing here is I just with a light touch with this white charcoal, kind of using it more as a blending tool and as a way to kind of refine the texture a little bit. But it's, it's very, very light. Um, just kind of moving the charcoal around to add a little bit of refinement to the end texture there. Um, but so far so good. I feel like it's working out pretty well. What I might want to do is um, I'm gonna, I kind of feel compelled to do this. Going to darken that background. Create a bit of a gradient back in there, just to kind of balance it out a little bit. Um, I might lift the value here a little bit. All right, thank you for the comments, everybody. I, Wilma is asking if I've ever dried poppy petals. I have not. I am. Uh, as I, as I, as I uh, revealed earlier in my ignorance of flower anatomy, uh, I am, uh, I have, it's an area of my world that needs, needs to be fed a bit more. I know very little about flowers, so. <laughs> um, but that sounds like an interesting thing to try out. I'll have to give that a shot. All right, so just a slight darkening in here starts to bring that edge out. And then um, what happens if I do this? If I lift in here, whoop, that's a bit too much. Yikes. So the thing about a drawing, so you can never really ruin it. I guess technically you can't, but um, I don't know, sometimes you just gotta take risks that doing something will ruin your drawing and then trust that you can reclaim it. I think it's important sometimes to take a drawing too far to help understand where the limits are. All right, so just by just trying to lift this, but I don't want it to be, you can look how blotchy that looks. Yeah. So now I gotta, Scramble to kind of correct it. 
I don't know if you've ever drawn, worked on a drawing and you get to this point where you, you make a decision, then you start to panic to try to fix it. And you're like, oh, yikes. So a little me just panicked there. But. I don't want this background to be distracting in here. Um, so using the, the kneaded eraser, it's all about pressure, letting it float on the page in some areas. But there, that, you know, in terms of balancing the composition feels a little bit better. gonna anchor it a little bit by emphasizing the stem just a bit more see how that does but all right all right thank you everybody some good comments um, Cindy I see your comment about paper um, uh, THM teach glad, uh, yeah, I'm, gl yeah, I'm glad you're keeping being at it, you know, drawing. And that's what this show is really all is about is we just, if you draw regularly, you're going to get better, but it's a never thing where you master. And I, I like to tell people, and I, this is what I remind myself is that in a way the one of the last things I want is to be a hundred percent happy with a drawing. Cause it's that little bit where you're like, Ooh, I want to make that one better. You know, that, that drives you to the next one or trying to find a new discovery about it. Or, you know, sometimes it's, you know, I, I really like that sense of discovery. And so, you know, exploring a new medium or trying to approach a drawing as though you're drawing for the first time, you know, that it, that's to me where it gets really exciting. Um, it starts to get boring when I think about, uh, you know, just simply try to kind of master one process over and over and over again. Uh, it's just not in my nature um, and so but that's what's cool about drawing is that everybody has a different relationship with it a different relationship to art and what motivates me might be entirely different than what motivates you and it's all good um, so um, blonde Lebanese <laughs> I appreciate the comment there about the mistake um, oh and Gail you're doing it in digital I would love to see that I think I've seen some I don't know if it was yours or not, but some people have posted online some kind of digital manipulations of their drawing, which is really cool. Um, all right, Mary C., thank you for the comments. And Heather, um, yeah, I, I, think I, I think I'm done. <laughs> I think my brain is shot. But I feel happy with this. It was fun, uh, and it's just good to be back with you live. It's been, only been two weeks since our last live one but it was, it felt like forever. So I'm very much looking forward to the next one. I'm working on a bear for the next one. We talked about that before. Uh, and so I'm gonna be working on a bear and some other fun subjects for this upcoming month. Um, so again, look, check out the, the link at the pin to the top of the chat. If you go to the artistnetwork.com slash art party, it'll take you to a page where you can register to join tomorrow's art party, um, as well as you can enter there to win the, the giveaway uh, of art materials from Jerry's Artorama. So the sketchbooks that I showed earlier, um, the fun toys like this uh, vacuum and this mechanical eraser, this cool sharpener, which I love because it collects all the charcoal dust. So I'm building up this reservoir that I want to use for kind of more char uh, powdered charcoal drawing. There's big charcoal sticks erasers, everything you need. It's a lot of fun. So, um, but you can, you can register there. So when that giveaway happens, I think you can go through to the end of the day on Friday to get that. So look, look on that page for details there. Um, but again, we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, or we can draw together. Um, I love to hear your ideas for images that we can draw from. So either um, post here on YouTube, Artist Network, you know, find me on Instagram, reach out. I love to connect with everybody. So um, it's been a blast. Um, yeah, it's not a bear bear, Mad Moments Go, but it is a brown bear. Uh, you'll have to bear with me on that one. Um, oh, and then, and Jackie, uh, Conte. Yes, I do need to try out some Conte. Um, all right. So I'm going to sign off, hang out for a few seconds because there's a delay and I want to make sure I capture any questions that come in, but, 
Um, I will see you all next week. Have a fantastic weekend. See some of you tomorrow. Just trying to compare how these look. The center is very different. I'm happier with I'm happier with this one. All right.